back. Hi. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken, also known as Will Flannery. I am Lady Glockenflecken, also known as Kristen Flannery. Took me a second to remember. You'd switch up the order, and I try to match you. <laughs> But you don't always go in the same uh, direction keep there. Keep you on your toes there. Oh, I know. I'm a little sleepy today. I didn't get much sleep last night. Why? I don't know. I just woke Did I up. Keep you up? No. I just woke up after four hours and couldn't get back to sleep for the rest of the night. Was I thrashing in my sleep? Not tonight. <laughs> there was one recently where you were twitching a bunch. So yeah. that woke me up. I think I was but... punching something in my sleep. Oh, you're having a dream. I think I was having a dream. Yeah. yeah you do a lot of weird sleep stuff. I, I mean, you have a very active sleep i do I, situation. I, sometimes some nights are more active than others yeah. like whenever my heart stops beating and i start having a well i think arrest. that was that was the uh a, a lack of action well uh, i guess that's true yeah All right. well speaking of hearts a lack of action actually that's a good potential that, that's a good uh you just did you make a like a <laughs> like an a, electricity joke i did that was nice. Action <laughs> potential. I don't even action. know if it made sense. Is that does that even apply to the heart? I don't it's think a so. Thing, I think yeah. it's the well, brain. There's, there's action potentials there in the heart. Okay, oh, of good. course there are. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Good. Trust me, I'm an ophthalmologist. I don't know. I'm very tired. All right. Well, we should talk about heart month since <gasps> oh, we're talking yes, about we hearts. Should. Uh so uh, heart month is in February. We are in it. And mm -hmm. uh we want to tell you about the Nation of Life Savers February social campaign. So uh, first, a little bit of stats here. Out of the 350,000 plus cardiac arrests that happen outside the hospital each year in the U.S., do you know how many survive? How many? I know you know already. I do know, but why don't you tell me? <laughs> One in 10. <laughs> yeah, it's not very many. One in 10. I'm kind of glad I didn't know that when, when your heart stopped beating because yes. that would have been scarier. As one of those one out of yes. 10. You're welcome. Uh, thank you so much again. Uh, as I, I wake up every morning and I just <laughs> lean over and say, thank you, Kristen, for giving me this life. And, uh, and then I say, your breath stinks and take out the trash. <laughs> So, it, it, <laughs> yes, just for back the record. to Heart Month. Um, uh, so this is, uh, we are just encouraging everybody to, in February, all of our followers, everybody who has a heart uh, <laughs> and <laughs> who has loved ones. We all have loved ones. We all, uh, everybody who's listening, uh, we encourage all of you to visit heart.org slash nation to learn how to perform hands-only CPR by watching a two-minute video. Yeah, hands-only CPR, two that's what minutes. I did on you. Yeah. And look, it worked. So you don't do the breaths. Right. You do, it's just just pumping on the chest, and it teaches you it just two minutes. That's heart.org slash nation. Slash, slash you want to try that again? Nation. Slash nation. That's a, <laughs> that's a hard thing. Heart dot org slash nation and a lot of our listeners and and watchers are mm -hmm. probably um physicians who may feel like well i don't need to go do that because i already know how to do cpr uh but as we learned the hard way you might but maybe someday you will be the one that, that needs, needs it. it and so maybe have your family members or your friends visit yes. i guarantee even if you're all you're if you're listening and you're in healthcare, i guarantee you have somebody in your life that is not and probably has never taken a class on CPR, doesn't know anything about it, maybe doesn't even know what it stands for. And so those are the people that, that you send them that link, heart.org slash nation, and, uh, and just have them watch that video um, and uh, tell them you won't talk to them ever again if they don't watch it. And no, I you always... don't have to do that. <laughs> Consider it, but it, it's okay if you don't. I always have to put a plug in too, anytime we're talking about um, CPR and especially bystander CPR is that... You know, let's also keep in mind that doing bystander CPR, you know, is it takes its own toll sometimes. And so we shouldn't forget about those people who mm -hmm. perform CPR after the fact. Make sure that we, we support them, too. So, you know, with your help, like we can and we can increase the survival rate of all of our loved ones, of our family, of our friends, the people in our lives uh, and around the world. So just check that out, please. Heart.org slash nation. Now. Let's get to our, our guest today. So today we're talking to Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal, a fascinating conversation. So she is a former emergency physician turned journalist. Yeah, long you don't hear that journalist very much. at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. um, and so for about 22 years, she wrote for the New York Times on a variety of different things, including healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, and is now a senior contributing editor at KFF Health News, which is how I found her. I read one of her articles. I was like, we got to have you come on. 
let's talk healthcare. Let's talk the, 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 the let's just have a really entirely depressing discussion about yes. U.S. healthcare, but also quite fascinating. Uh, and now uh, she is also an author of a New York Times bestseller, An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. So very much enjoy talking with her. Fascinating discussion. Yeah. An important topic and, yeah. and a thing that I think, you know, the average person doesn't know enough about. And sometimes that's by design. That's so right. sometimes knowledge is power. Should we get to it? Let's do it. There she is, Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal. Today's episode is brought to you by the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience, or DAX for short. This AI-powered ambient technology helps physicians be more efficient and reduce clinical documentation burden. To learn more about how DAX Copilot can help reduce burnout and restore the joy of practicing medicine, stick around after the episode or visit nuance.com slash discover DAX. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. All right, we are here with Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal. Uh, it, should we call you Elizabeth? Yeah, is that, that's fine. Does that work? Yeah. All right, all right. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I I first found you actually on Twitter, or now X, oh, I should say. Yeah. But I read uh, one of your pieces on KFF News on the newsfeed. I was like, I have to talk to this person because, uh, and then I learned about all your other writings, the book that you've written. Um, about uh, uh, that's called an American sickness, how healthcare became big business and how you can take it back. And I was like, this is like right up our alley. Yeah. What we talk about with healthcare. So thank you so much for being here with us. Sure. Thanks. Um, I, I, I dare not ask which piece you read because some of them I'm more <laughs> proud of than others. And, um, you know, I've well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tell you which one I read. I read the one uh, from hospital to hospitality. I think it was your most, oh, your, yeah, your yeah, latest yeah. one. That was, uh, you know, that's been bugging me for years, that thing, but, um, and this was just so our listeners know, this is about many hospitals out there that have really leaned into this, the idea that, that going to the hospital or seeking health care, uh, there should be this big focus on providing hospitality with, mm -hmm. you know, like a you know, Michelin star food and, and, and surrounded by fine art and everything right. and, and taking the focus away from actual health care. Yeah. And I was pretty shocked, you know, that started, that was a bee in my bonnet when I was back at the Times and I would get to ask, you know, I would be asked to speak to a med school class or at a hospital grand rounds and I would go into the hospital and I would be like, they, they would be going like, don't you want to see the art? Like, look, the floor is a, you know, a tiled representation of the Great Lakes. And I would be like, oh, and here's the concierge. And, you know, when I trained, like, there was no such thing as a concierge at, the, at a hospital. And then when I was doing my right. book, I, I realized, oh, no, it was before when I was still at the New York Times, um, that some hospitals had actually hired hotel executives to really lean into that hospitality thing. Oh my gosh. And my favorite thing we did, which you should look at if you, if you had, if you missed it, because of course most people did in those days, right before I left the New York times, we did, um, it was just a little quiz called, is this a hospital or a hotel? And it was just 12 pictures <laughs> and you could test yourself. <laughs> the link is still there and no one gets, you know, you can't tell the difference. In fact, the hospitals are probably a little more upscale and it, you know, the good, the, well, I mean, now even the, the best hospitals, I'm like, why do you guys need a spa? I mean, people come to, you know, the Mayo Clinic or Johns Hopkins or mm -hmm. for the, for the healthcare. Like I'm not going there because right. I, I want to go. I mean, I don't want a crappy meal, but you know, I, when yeah. I want a restaurant, I'll go to a restaurant. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I noticed that uh, whenever I was interviewing for residency programs and I walked into the front entrance at Mayo Clinic and I was surrounded by marble and and uh, and the, my immediate thought was, oh, I am not dressed well enough for this place. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this might not be for me. But it's 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 
Yeah, go ahead. No, did you bring your bathing suit and you know your tennis? <laughs> no, no. I was dressed a little tennis. bit better than that, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's it's um it, it's, and you said that you have it's been a bee in your bonnet for for quite a while now. I mean, is this was that just in in continuing with this vein of hospitality mm-hmm. as healthcare? When did you did you see a shift at some point where you felt felt like it started to change? Maybe when you were practicing, or you know, or is this? Do you feel like this is a more recent thing? Uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of a dinosaur. I left practicing medicine in the mid '90s, so then you know it was still. Frankly, the ER was pretty kind of a gross place where I worked, and I worked at a fancy hospital. You know, it 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 could have been a little nicer. And I saw the leading edge, you know, people come in with clipboards and we did have like a VIP service. If, you know, really important people came into the ER, they got like, I mean, they they actually didn't get anything nicer, but they got into the room quicker, but it was still the crappy stretcher and the, you know, the linoleum Mm -hmm. floors and stuff like that. But it really came back to haunt me. So, so, and then I was out of the U.S. for 10 years as a foreign correspondent. When I came back, I was like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, uh, these don't look like the places Uh I once knew. And beyond that, um, you know, over the last three or four years, my husband and I have had some health issues that required interacting with some really great hospitals. Um, uh, and, And But, you know, my my husband has cancer and he's doing well right now. But they kept talking about our journey. And I'm like, this is not my idea of a journey, right? Like journey is when I go to Paris or when I go to the beach. (laughs) You know, I'm grateful that we're getting good care, but fun it's not. You know, it was I I said to um, the editor who edited that piece, it's more like and, you know, I lived in China for a while. I think of it more as like Mao's long march. You know, you're trudging along <laughs> through the mountains yes. without, you know, it's <sighs> it's just a slog. And I'm grateful yeah. for it. But to try and pretend it's a journey and how how that rebranding has happened throughout healthcare of, you know, this is fun. Yeah. You know, healthcare is, it, it's really great. It's great that we have it. But you know, fun, not, not for me at least, um, you know, I'd say not for most people. Right. And I mean, there's a push for, um, you know, patient focused and family patient centered and family centered care. Right. Which I think is great, but this seems like taking it too far, right. Of like, not what you actually need. It seems like we're operating in the extremes right now. It's like either it's horrible or it's, you know, a five-star resort. But how about if we just have like a happy medium where like everybody's <laughs> yeah. getting what they need, but it doesn't need to be extravagant. Yeah. Right. And I think that 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 would be a good place to be, right? I, I sometimes joke, you yeah. know, Mark Cuban has done this thing with drugs, cost plus drugs, where he takes the cost of making the drug and marks it up 15% and sells it. Like I kind of dream of a like target for healthcare. So for, you know, no frills, like I don't need bottles of champagne in the room, you know, I, I, you know, I I want decent food, but I really don't care. I don't know. I live, (laughs) I I, I live in New York, so I have plenty of museums. I don't need to go to a hospital to see art. So I just think, you know, if it was cost neutral, sure, I guess, fine. You know, we could all get our health care at the Sheraton. But, you know, I think one of the reasons we pay so much for care is people are building these palaces of health care when what they should be doing is building, uh, you know, institutions that are really good at delivering care, not not mm-hmm. not uncomfortable, but not luxurious. Um, is right. my thing. Right. If it was free, I would be like, yeah, sure, you know, bring it on. But it's not. Right. And this is something you've, you've just the, the um, uh, healthcare costs uh, and billing. And this is an area that you've been interested in for quite some time. I mean, as a New York Times, of course, 
the correspondent and uh you know you you have looked at this for more than 20 years and and now continuing that work with k k k a k k k formally it's like twitter you know it's kff television formerly known as it's getting tripped up because our podcast acronym is kkh so we're so used to saying that that's right that we (laughs) but i'm curious how how you got on that path because you started as uh, obviously in in healthcare you were you're a, a practicing emergency physician yeah so what was it that really put you on this path to to delving into healthcare costs you know it wasn't Initially, now I'm going to show like what a dinosaur I am. But initially, I'd I'd always loved writing. I did it on the side. Mm-hmm. I come from a family of doctors, and I always thought it was I, I liked being an ER doc. I was wondering how you got into medicine from a getting a master's at, in in English at Cambridge. Yeah, well, that was and a bachelor's in uh, history, yeah, right? It was yeah. history and biology undergrad. So I, I undergrad, I thought I would go to med school, and then I kind of got really lucky and got this scholarship to the UK for uh, Mm -hmm. two, which I extended to three years and, you know, wanted to do something really different. And uh, so I did uh, English literature there, knowing I was going to come back to med school. I'd already applied and gotten in. And the third year was because I wasn't so sure I was knowing I wanted to go to med school, but um, I did. And, um, I was pretty happy as as a doctor, but even then, and this was, remember, I I, I trained um, at a time when there were no drugs for AIDS, right before the, the drugs for AIDS came onto the market. So I was in New York City, was seeing some really, really sick patients and some problems because some of them didn't have good insurance coverage. You know, it's an urban ER. And we take Mtala, we took all types, which is great. But a lot of the problems were social problems. So now here's where I go into really like dinosaur land. Um, I was writing for the New York Times on a freelance basis and others. And um, there was something that came along called the Clinton Health Plan. Remember that? Probably maybe you weren't born i i've I've heard the words yes i I guess we were it was uh you know we were young we don't need to go into we don't need to go into how much this dates me but (laughs) um at the time said uh do you want to come on and cover that and i was like sure i'll come on and cover that and you know it will pass and then i'll go back to being an er doctor um and uh of course it didn't pass and uh, I didn't go back. And partly it was just that I got kind of hooked on the journalism thing. And I saw, well, maybe I can make a living doing this. But um, it was also more one of those life happens things. Um, In, I guess it was the mid 90s. So I've been practicing for a few years in the ER. And uh, New York State decided that to practice in an ER, you had to be ER boarded and I was internal medicine boarded. So I would have had to go back oh. and it really wasn't a big lift, but I would have had to go back and do the, the stuff to grandfather. And, and at the same time, my yeah. second kid was born and the night shifts were getting a little, uh, you know, I wasn't a very good mom when I was, you know, up all night. So basically when the times said, come on board. I thought I would go back and then I didn't go back. And then my husband and I got offered like uh, the gig to go to China, which uh, when, when our kids were three and five and, you know, people said, well, why, why did you do that? And it was partly my joking answer, which is three quarters true or not. I would know I was really interested in going overseas. The kids were at a good age, but also I didn't want to, figure out, like, have to figure out where my daughter would go to school in New York City, like, which was a night, which is a night, perennial nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> it was easier right. to move to China. So, yeah. you know, we moved to China. They got great educations and, or they, we made it through yeah. uh, elementary school there. And, um, you know, and it was a fascinating story too. So, you know, what an adventure for a young family to be able to right. have. And at that point, I wasn't particularly interested in health costs for me because 
I had good insurance, you know, people with good insurance. Like it's hard when I tell my kids who are now in their late twenties and early thirties, like that it used to be like this. They're like, wow, you're describing the dark ages, you know, that like in the nineties, if you had employer provided insurance, your employer mostly just paid the premiums. There was, there, there weren't deductibles. There weren't co-pays. It just covered stuff. I mean, my two um, birthing experiences, um, one of which was a C-section, I think I, I paid 25 bucks for a TV hookup or something like that. You know, oh, wow. it, it just was a different world. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so um, then I was overseas for about 10 years and first in, in China, whose health system I wouldn't want to emulate, but I was there for bird flu and SARS and uh, all the, the, you know, oh, wow. yeah. and um, rural AIDS and all sorts of stuff that was medically related. But I was writing about other things, too. And then I had um, a beat based in Europe where I was writing about environmental stuff. And then at some point, um, you know, because the European countries were really big on climate adaptation, even before we believed in climate change in this country. Um, and then um, I, you know, <laughs> my editor in his wisdom, the, the uh, head, the top editor at the New York Times was like, we don't want you flitting around Europe anymore, which um, it was a great gig. But um <laughs> we want you to come back to New York. And that happens, you know, people, once people are overseas for a long time, they're like time to come back to New York to the mothership. And how long were you away? 10 years. How many years? 10 years. 10 years. Decade. And the thing that oh. happened when I came back, that's when like I got the health cost bug. Cause that was from 97 to 2007. Right. And all of a sudden, like the augmenting for my kids ear infections, which was like, cheap even when it was was branded was suddenly off patent and 200 bucks and my little asthma inhaler my albuterol inhaler which you know was ten dollars was now like with insurance some crazy number and um i was just like wow what what has happened in this country it's gone berserk and um yeah and and I got I wanted to know why and what had happened and um, you know I also came back in that kind of seminal year for um, for uh, preventive care I had to have my first colonoscopy right so um, uh, you know this is uh, you know probably not a story you need on a podcast but anyway it it was oh yeah no we need all okay. of it okay yeah. we, we, we know all the stories you should you should see what okay. some people have brought to <laughs> okay. this podcast well, yeah so, <laughs> so i you know i knew that healthcare costs have gotten expensive and there were these things called deductibles and copays and networks and so i went to my hr department and said well how do i get this procedure like free or cheap and of course meaning free or cheap to me right and so they said oh right. right you just have to do it in network and it's fine right so i look at the network and there's um you know memorial sloan kettering cancer center and i'm like okay fine you know cancer center cancer screening i book my appointment and uh you know voila you know uh clean colonoscopy and then I got the EOB, which didn't even exist before. And I'm looking at the EOB. And of course, the first thing you look at is the what you owe now. And it was zero. So I was like, hooray. And then I look up the EOB and it's like, oh, my God, they charged like $12,000, you know, because there's the operating room fee, you know, the facility fee right. and the anesthesia fee and the, and all these other fees. And I'd seen, you know, colonoscopies done in doctor's offices, you know, without all the bells and whistles. And I kind of had a hint that it was going to be expensive. I mean, I trained partly at, at Memorial. So I knew like when they had me put on my bonnet and booties and they, they were wheeling me into like, a fancy operating room and there were people in scrubs all around and monitors. But I was like, 
you know, whatever. Um, so yeah. too late now. Yeah. <laughs> cashmere booties, yeah. cashmere yeah. bonds. Well, you, you know, know, that, yeah. that get that thing. push of propofol and it all seems like a dream. But um, <laughs> that's right. You know, so um, so. Well, I'm I'm curious whenever you were in like. Because a lot of people will compare systems in the U.S. to other yep. countries, mm -hmm. right? And I every time I put a video out talking about the U.S. healthcare system and some terrible thing or to, relating to private equity or consolidation yeah. or something, I'll, I'll I'll get all these people from Europe who are like, I don't know how you do it over there. Mm -hmm. Like this is uh, this is unfathomable. Like it sounds like a hellscape to be in the U.S. <laughs> experiencing healthcare. Yeah. So did you get a sense while you were in Europe and other parts of the world? Oh, yeah. I mean, what in, what worked, what didn't work, what, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm, i you know, at that point in my life, I was a pretty avid jogger and um, also pretty inattentive to uh, roots and sidewalks and things like that. So I had a couple oh, no, of... it's a bad combination. I've, yeah, I, I had a couple of falls. I am... Um, broke a wrist in Sweden. And, um, you know, there I was on New York Times foreign correspondent insurance. So they sent me to this fancy hospital. You know, I saw the orthopedist, it's saying, you know, got the x-ray, he put a splint on and then they apologized like, oh my God, we're so sorry. We have to charge you $400. And I was like, so that was one data point, right? And then right. I, my second, um, my second slip was in um, Rome, where uh, I ran into a, a branch and slid open my head. And uh, it was a Sunday, and I asked a friend where should I go, and he said, "Oh, Gemelli Hospital. That's where the Pope goes." And I was like, "Good enough for me." Good enough for right. the Pope. <laughs> yeah, right. And you know, again, they stitched it up. Um, looked great and uh, apologized for having to charge me like 112 euros, which was then about $140. So when I came back to the U.S. and was like hearing, you know, seeing all these healthcare prices, I was like, this is nuts. Like, and, and, you know, what is going on? And, um, when my uh, editor, because I'd been covering climate, said, we really want you to come back and cover health care. I said, the only thing I want to do is cover prices and costs. And uh, in his wisdom, he let me do this series called Paying Till It Hurts. Um, the, first, um, <laughs> the first installment of that series is about the cost of colonoscopies. And now you know why. Um, much to the horror <laughs> right. of of the New York Times photo editors, who are like, "What, what oh, are we going to do? How are we going to do that?" <laughs> you know, it's like, "Oh man!" But you know, I, I think because I had heard while I was overseas stories about U.S. healthcare getting expensive, and you know, the the million dollar cancer treatment, and but I think when people read those stories, their first reaction is not the system is really messed up and expensive, but like, oh, I hope I don't get that kind of cancer because that's really expensive. So what, what I really wanted to do in the Pain Till It Hurts series is to focus on things that we all encounter, you know, a colonoscopy, getting stitches in an ER as I had in Rome, which, you know, um, in the U.S. would, if you're lucky, cost you a couple thousand and maybe up to 40,000 if you, you know, if someone said for right. stitches. Yeah. If someone says gold plated stitches, if someone says, you know, this is a, a lesson. If someone says, and it's usually a kid who has a cut chin and, the, and they say to the parent, would you like a plastic surgeon to do that? And, you know, it's like, no, don't say yes to that question. Yeah. I right. mean, if it's in the, I, I you know, I, I've had if you need a plastic right, you surgeon, need, but people, right. sure. You know, but. No one says, "Oh, <laughs> it'll cost you an extra forty thousand bucks to, to have it that way." Right. So, um, right, it's that lack of transparency, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and the lack of choice. Um, so yeah. you know, I, I, we did that series, and the way we did that series, which was very kind of nouveau at the time, was we put out a call out saying, "Anyone have experience of?" 
high hospital bills or high medical bills. And we were flooded. You know, we were totally flooded. And all the stories in that series and all the stories in my book come from people writing to me about their billing experiences. And now um, I've kept that up at uh, what was formerly Kaiser Health News, now KFF Health News, where we do um, this bill of the month project uh, where people yes. tell us about their medical bills. And, you know, the thing is, why have I kept at it? Um, partly when I wrote the book naively, I thought, oh, you know, people will read this, they'll, they'll see what the problems are, and then it will all change and the book will go out of print or something, which, you know, I'm sure was not what my publisher wanted or, you know, <laughs> but, um, and it shows how naive I was. Um, so, you know, here we are, my, our, our bill of the month project and my inbox has become kind of the garbage pail for everyone who's had bad experiences, particularly with costs, because people don't complain a lot about the care. You know, people generally right. like the care or did until there was all this like finagling with, uh, you know, did I really see a doctor? I mean, now we're seeing more people going like, wait a second, there's a, a, a doctor's name on this bill, but I never saw a doctor. Um, you right. know, so there's, you know, the business of medicine is endlessly creative and the regulators are, you know, they, they're a big ship that turns slowly and doesn't catch a lot of what goes on. So here I am still, you know, banging my head against the wall on this stuff. Sad. Well, I want to, I want to explore um, this, uh, you know, the topic of your book a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Let's take a quick break. We'll be right back. Kristen, are you familiar with AI? Yes, I have not been living under a rock. There are AI tools for everything now. That's right. Well, guess what? We have Precision. This is the first ever EHR integrated infectious disease AI platform. This is super cool. For uh, any specific patient, it automatically highlights better antibiotic regimens. It empowers clinicians to save more lives while reducing burnout. It just makes their life easier. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and also antibiotic stewardship. Yeah. Really cool things. To see a demo of this, go to precision.com slash KKH. That's precision spelled with an X instead of an E. So P-R-X-C-I-S-I-O-N dot com slash KKH. All right, we are back with Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal. So Elizabeth, uh, your book, An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. Um, I love this. And I love that you use a lot of, of real life examples of people having to, to grapple with this, these exorbitant medical bills, because narratives really seem to, to just draw people in and get people to understand just how serious of a problem this is. And so how, I guess my first question is how, how was this a hard book for you to write just from a, like an emotional standpoint, because this is serious. You know, these are piece of people's lives. This is a, um, a, a daunting subject and can probably take a quite a toll on you emotionally. Yeah, I, I kind of had steam coming out of my ears for most of the time I was writing the book. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, it 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 wasn't so hard because people had sent me these stories. And, you know, as a journalist, what you do is try and unpack how this happened, how this could have happened. So it was more, I mean, it was, it was enraging, but it was really, I, I learned so much. It wasn't like I went in thinking, oh, I get how we got, you know, why the facility fee at Sloan Kettering costs $5,000. I knew it did cost that much, but I'm like, how did we get this Why? thing How did it get called a facility fee, which no other country has? You know, if you call a can, can you give us can you give us an example? Like what? Tell us something that 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 opened your eyes. Like whoa, I had no idea until I actually looked into it. Oh, well, I think I mean there were so many things, but one of them that really shocked me was when I was in medical school. I had worked on a 
floor of I thought I didn't want kids. So I, you know, when I had to do a pediatrics rotation, I picked teenagers, right? And in that era, mm -hmm. it was um it was a, a cystic fibrosis ward and it was a devastating three months. So, you know, in the interim, um, this drug, these new drugs for cystic fibrosis had come out, which were miraculous for people with CF, right? And I'm like, well. How did those come to be? You know, it's not a very common disease. And I learned that um, the Cystic Fibrosis, sorry, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation had engaged in this thing called venture philanthropy with a small pharmaceutical firm. And the, and you know, so they had given the donations that, you know, small donors and big donors gave and paid it to this drug company. This drug company amazingly came up with these drugs. But the CF Foundation never said, hey, we funded this research, so we should have some control over the price. And, you know, so now these drugs are miraculous, but the prices are off the wall, you know? So, and it's, it, it's a perfect example of, you know, how out of whack the way we price drugs is that, you know, much, many drugs are, you know, the, the, the basic research is done at the NIH, um, a lot of it at universities, then a, a pharmaceutical manufacturer brings it to market, and we have no way to limit what we pay for them. And I, I just had no idea. My dad was a hematologist, another small example, before factor eight was available, right? Uh, so, um, mm -hmm. you know, factor eight has changed the lives of uh, boys with hemophilia. They play sports, they, you know, but they need this drug, um, you know, a million bucks a year forever, um, you know? That's insane. So, yeah. you know, how much, if it's your kid, you're going to, you know, you're, people pay it because you're not going to subject your kid to not paying it. And insurers have to pay for it because mm -hmm. it works. But in, com in, in some countries where there are cost limitations, they will either negotiate down that price or if they can't, they'll just say we cannot treat people with this disease, which is tragic. I mean, most just negotiate it down to a, a reasonable price. but. Um, you know, I was shocked. I, I was just like, wait. Yeah. I, and, you know, I, the tip I got that led to that chapter on hemophilia, which was, I think, the last chapter in the book, was from someone who'd worked from one of the companies that makes Factor Eight, And she told me that, you know, they had this massive sales force to kind of lure families into, you know, that drug company's um, sphere because you lure a family that has two kids with hemophilia and you've upped your profits by two million bucks a year and it's for life right so um it's it's yeah. it's a really it's a really sick world out there and that's a bad pun so <laughs> yeah it's so discouraging like it's so hard to have faith in humanity after you know hearing stories like that uh, it's it's enraging and it's disgusting and like yeah. I don't know what we can do about it though. Well, I mean that's what what do you think? I'm I'm curious to hear your thoughts on on the the best ways or the ways because we have we have had wins in the healthcare system in terms of giving a little bit more power back to consumers yep. to patients. Um, yeah, the first thing that jumps to my mind is the No Surprises Act. Yeah, that, that uh, was a big you know. one. You know, that chapter of my book is now, well, I, I won't say it's totally irrelevant because somehow, <laughs> somewhat bizarrely, ground ambulances were exempt from that act. And right. uh, so, right. you know, why? Is all politics. Like, is, 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 yeah, because a lot of local yeah. governments make money from, from ambulance rides. You know, I was shocked by that when I, when I was practicing, right. you know, it was like the volunteer guys or the, you know, 
no one got bills for ambulances. But then cities realized, hey, this, you know, our our uh, our fire departments put out fires for free, but you need a ride to the hospital. Um, you know, no, we're gonna you're gonna pay for that. It's it's nuts, right? So, so it it still seems though with that, it it's easy to just kind of feel like it. You you just it's best to just give up because <laughs> yeah, no. like nothing's right. Like nothing can touch these billion dollar. Well, corporations. that's what they want you to do. Right. Well, right. <laughs> but I mean, but the point is that, that through legislation, that's still like the way to fight back. Right. Like, yeah. That's... And I, I, a way. I, I do think, you know, when there was criticism of my book and it was fair was the, how you can take it back. The, the things an individual patient can do are rather limited. Like I can decide, yeah. you know, if my doctor at, you know, X big hospital system orders blood and it's going to go to a hospital lab, I can say no, uh, have it sent to Quest because I don't want to have to pay a big copay that I know the hospital lab is going to charge more. Um, you know, you can shop around for some things, but that's really hard to do. Like if you're, if your kid is sick, are you going to like shop around for the, the cheaper, I mean, even to look for which hospital Yeah, in the moment. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just, yeah. well, even getting labs, I didn't realize you had a choice of where they go. I thought they just send them to the lab, you know, they, they, <laughs> there's just one big lab. I don't know. They do. Well, then each place like <laughs> yeah, yeah. works with a particular one and that's right. what you're stuck with. Right. right. And that's, you know, we get a lot of bill of the months about that, that, you know, my doctor said, why yeah. don't we just get these labs and, you know, one click of the computer and it goes to, and then suddenly it's a, uh, you know, $1,800 bill for routine lab work. Um, I always say. Right. And it's not like there was anything along the way to let the patient know that that's yeah. what it costs there. And it costs something less somewhere yeah, else. And I always say that, you know, labs are kind of like the booze for, of hospitals. They can mark it up to whatever they want. And, you know, it's, it, some labs, yeah, they 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 may be better at some places than others, but most are just kind of, you know, you put the tube in the machine and it gives you a number. So, um, right. So I I think the what you can take it back, how you can take it back, was a little anemic compared to the problems. And I, so I do think, yeah, you need government. And whenever I say that, I don't mean like. Everyone goes, oh, there's too much regulation in healthcare, which is, we just regulate the wrong things, you know. So we we right, yeah. we don't regulate drug prices, which is hard, and we probably sh we're starting to we're we're starting to, um, you know, surprise bills that that was a win, you know, the even during the Trump administration where there was the requirement that hospitals list their prices unfortunately it right. said in a machine a machine readable format which means that most humans can't actually make heads or tails of of this but <laughs> right you know there there are steps in the right direction because i think the outrage among voters i'm i'm always surprised it's not greater you know they're they're more like what can i do i feel helpless I think part of that is, is uh, it almost seems like a lot of these corporations are purposefully trying to keep things under the radar. Oh, yeah. yeah they don't. Or complicated. Right. So you have they, to they, really or, put in a lot of effort to be exactly. able to understand. Yeah. It's, and it, it's even some of these things are, I always use the example of pharmacy benefit managers. I was like a physi practicing physician for like five years before I even had really heard the term pharmacy benefit manager. And, and I'm, I'm a physician, I'm in healthcare. And so it, and, and it's, it's a very complicated subject, just like a lot of things in our healthcare system are. And I think maybe it didn't start out purposefully trying to be complicated, but I think it works to the advantage of some of these organizations because people just don't know who's to blame. Sure. Well, that, and just like a general sense of, you know, cynicism and distrust in our institutions and in our systems right now. It just, it does. It feels like, well, who's supposed to fix it? The politicians, they're the ones that implement the regulations, the legislators, like 
nobody has faith in our political system right now and in our representatives and whatnot. So oh boy, it is just easy to spiral into hopelessness. Yeah, I, I agree. And I try and fight that. And I think what you're seeing with something like yeah. the pharmacy benefit managers is every time there's a problem, like drug prices are too high, you know, the hospitals don't want to pay them. There's there's a new layer of middlemen who comes in and takes a cut, right? So everything sp- spirals up, you know. I didn't know that there were things, <laughs> when you talk to the orthopedists, you know, they're like, okay, there's the joint manufacturers at one end of this very long chain of, of intermediaries, each one taking a little cut, and you end up with a joint, uh, you know, a, a, a joint replacement that's, you know, three times as much as in any other country. And, you know, the orthopedists, right. they're partly like, I mean, it's a little bit comical, becomes like the circular firing squad where they go like, well, we deserve, you know, half a million a year because the joint salesman, the joint rep from, you know, uh, from Stryker is making, has a nicer house than me. And we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of blame to go around and it's very uncomfortable for everyone. And I think at some level, you know, it's very hard for the patients to coalesce and complain, except they can vote. But I'm I'm a little surprised, and we're seeing it a little more now, that the physicians who who are also getting the raw end of this this Byzantine system that they have to work in and deal with every day, it would make me insane. And I know it is yeah. making a lot of a lot of people want to leave the field, which is tragic. Or, or at yeah, least not morale happy. has never been lower, yeah. right? It's it's a it's a, a huge problem. But, yeah. Hmm. Well, that's cheerful. Yeah, I well, can, I, <laughs> you want me to tell you a funny <laughs> story now? <laughs> let's see. Let, let's hear. It. What What do you got? Do you have Do you have a funny story for us? Uh, hmm. <laughs> How about from your uh, anything interesting from your uh, emergency medicine? Practicing medicine days. Oh yeah, I'm sure you've oh, seen all yeah. sorts. I of mean, things. I love that, and it was it was um, yeah, because I was. Do you miss uh, it? Oh, I missed certain things about it, and every once in a while, you know, everyone yeah. has this, these moments with whatever they do. It's like, oh, I should have stayed a doctor. Yeah. When my editor asked for a big rewrite on a story, I'm just like, oh, I don't need this. I should have just. Yeah. But um on the other hand, you're not writing notes. Yes. Right. Yes. And I, I'm grateful for that. Um but yeah, you know, <laughs> I our our ER was like the world in a microcosm because it was um on the upper east side of Manhattan. So we got, you know, the UN people, the fancy people and the street people and the drug deals gone bad. I mean I mean, I had, oh, man, you, saw everything. I, you know, I had, I, uh, this one, this one guy, you know, and this was kind of standard issue, you know, someone would come in with, it was usually a stab wound because it's New York and not a lot of gun, gun violence and they'd have to go to the OR and you'd be, the nurses would be taking stuff out of the pockets and they'd be going like, you know, there'd be 20,000 bucks and some crack files and they're like, damn, how did that get there? I was just walking and you're just like, okay, enough. <laughs> like, yeah, hmm, okay, how did that stop, get there? Stop the story. But I mean, wow. and, and then, you know, we would have yeah. people from the UN. Um, I had a former president who was constipated, which was my, which really impressed my kids. They were like, oh, wow, you treated a president. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. But it was mostly the nurses that did the did the work there and um right oh my goodness you know it was it was i mean it was terrifying because you saw everything that could, could go wrong when i had young kids it mm-hmm. was part of i think yeah. what what kind of made it so emotionally difficult was like you know in the yard doc you would see the kid who got over the window guards and thought he could fly and jumped out you know, over, and he was, miraculously, this kid was okay. Um, uh, or, 
you know, but then, then during the marathon, you would see the Ethiopian runner who stepped on a nail on the Brooklyn Bridge. And, you know, Oof. it was just like, it was every, it, it was like you saw the world in every shift. And it was, it was fun that way. And wow. I always loved diagnosing things. So that was, that was really fun too. Um, yeah, so I do miss it. Um, I, you know, people often say, "Wow, going from an ER to journalism—that must—that's like so different." And I'm, I really yeah. felt like, hey, my interviewing classes in med school were really helpful for journalism. And once you work in a New York City ER, you walk into a room and you're not afraid to ask anyone questions, right? And that's a lot of what journalism is about you know yeah. you're the president of china i don't care i'm gonna you know i'm not gonna ask you about your constipation but i am gonna ask you about right. like <laughs> human rights and i you know yeah so it it it, it there's some transferable skills yeah there, yeah, yeah. definitely sure. definitely and um you know i think a lot of journalists could do with a med school interviewing class where you ah, don't know but you know, you, what you learn is, of course, and you've been there, you don't ask leading questions. Like too many people as journalists mm -hmm. go in thinking they know the story and they don't listen very well because the the actual story is much more interesting, but they don't hear it. So anyway. Well, let's um, let's take a, one more break and then we'll come back. We have a, a listener story that we can oh. we can read. So we'll be right, right back. <laughs> Hey, Kristen. What's up? Name something that's like crusty and flaky. Mm, a delicious croissant. I appreciate your optimism. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I was thinking? What? Demodex blepharitis. That is not as delicious. <laughs> Do you know what these little guys are? What? These are Demodex mites. Yeah. That's not They're cute, fun. though, aren't they? Those ones They're are cute. cute. If you have red, itchy, irritated eyelids, you might be surprised to find out that it's a disease called Demodex blepharitis. Mm. caused by these little guys, Demodex mites. Do you ever see those in your clinic? Yeah, occasionally. It's not, it's not uncommon. Are they that cute when you see them under the microscope? Not quite. Mm. All right, but That's you can make bad. an appointment with your eye doctor and get an eyelid exam where they can help you know for sure if what you're suffering from is Demodex blepharitis. To find out more, go to eyelidcheck.com. Again, that's E-Y-E-L-I-D check.com to get more information about Demodex blepharitis and these little guys, Demodex mites. All right, we are back with Dr. Rosenthal. So, um, Elizabeth, we have um, we have a story from one of our listeners that we can uh, that we're going to read here. Uh, I, neither of us know what this is about, so this is all going to be a, a a fun experience for the three right. of us. Yes, here. our producer Rob likes to uh, try to throw us for a loop with those yeah, things, he throws so us some curveballs we'll from get. time to time. All right, so. <laughs> This is a story from Lucille. Lucille says, I was an RN, a nurse manager in a short procedure unit that prepped endocrinology, bronchoscopy, radiology, and OR patients. Stationed in the hospital, we did both inpatients and outpatients. An inpatient came down pre-colonoscopy to the prep area. The prep was not clear. She had soiled herself. The two nurses were cleaning her. They lifted her. Um, uh, abdominal hangover, the panis, yeah. that's the, yeah. kind of the, the belly, uh, and out flew several winged insects. Ooh. Ew. Oh, I... Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. They went on with it, but being ever the professional, these nurses, they went on with their task, not missing a beat. I can't do that job. <laughs> No, as I very clearly just demonstrated. <laughs> well, you know, New York City, um, you do get the uh, cockroaches in the ear. Um, that is a a oh no a thing. Oh. You know, my ear feels. I bet you do. Um, but yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I at some level, my husband will like. I'll see like something gross, like a a cut, and and and. Oh, he cut his palm on a bagel knife. Like it's the classic New York injury, right? And he needed stitches. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's so gross. You know, and he's like, you worked in an ER. Like what? And I'm like, oh, 
you know, it, it can't be grossed it's out. It's different. Yeah. You know, it's just different yeah, when yeah. you're when it's your job and you like go, oh yeah, that's a cockroach. Well, I probably, I probably once a week, no, once a week, probably like once a month, I'll have somebody come in convinced like they have some kind of of parasite like in their eye <laughs> mm. or some kind of like they saw a bug in their eye or does it turn like, out to be floaters or a worm or something time? so a lot of times it does turn out to be just floaters mm-hmm. that are in the eye uh but the vast majority of the time there's nothing there so it's it's uh but i always even i feel like what am i right. gonna see what am i like right that's that's the all that's also kind of difficult for is me it scarier well. for you to think about what you're gonna see or that whatever's in there you have to take out no, I don't. I don't mind the taking out. It's like the the initial Just potential shock of scare. like seeing <laughs> like a worm in the eye because that's not something you see every day. And and so I think it's it's more like the 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 mental image you have of something. And yeah, then, gross, uh, right? But then, yeah, you, you, it's <laughs> gross, gross, right? It's gross. And so, but you, but but you're you take care of it because you're a medical professional. Well, I that's can't just what do, you do any bugs in any locations. You, that's not in my skill set. Do you ever worry? Like, I'm going to ask you two questions. Okay. Uh, do you ever worry, yeah. hey, it's going to be hard to convince this person that they don't have a bug in their eye? Uh, oh, yeah. And, yeah. And- Actually, that's that's a good question uh, because you would think so, like if they're that convinced. But often what these what patients need is just reassurance from a medical professional. Right. And like they just I just want to make sure sometimes I'll hear I just want to make sure I'm not going blind or I want to make sure I don't have. A, a parasitic worm, worm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so if I just, that's all, I don't even have to like sometimes give an explanation for their symptoms sometimes. They're just happy that they're going to be yeah. fine. And so most of the time that's the case. Now, the second question is the hard one for, for physicians is like, do you ever think, okay, how much is my, well, maybe I think you're in private practice. So, but if you were in yeah. an ER, like how much is this patient going to be charged to because I can tell you, we see a lot mm-hmm. of those bills where people literally they have they they sit in the waiting room for three hours, they get bored, they leave, and they get a bill because for you know three thousand bucks because they registered and someone took their vitals. So you know my thing when I talk to yeah. medical schools is or medical students or residents is like ask your hospital how much they're charging for X, Y, or Z. I mean, and I'm, I was yeah. guilty as, as ever when I was, you know, if, if when I practice in an ER, it was as it is now where I would be like, oh, why don't we just get a CT scan? And the reason why not is yeah. because it's going to be 14,000 bucks if you do it from this ER. And if they get it as an outpatient next week, it's going to be 500. And you know, a lot of hospitals won't tell their residents and won't tell their physicians what they're oh, charging because yeah. they it's that secrecy you're talking about. Like, it's better to not let anyone in the system know. Yeah, it and never in training, it never even crossed my mind. How much does this cost that I'm doing? Yeah. Like, I never even thought about it. I think maybe part of that, a big part of that is is the education piece was not given right, to us. It's like that's, it wasn't a priority from the people who are training us. Yeah. So it's not going to be a priority for yeah. us to learn that. Well, then do they even they have that information? The ones don't. that are right, training you? Right. Probably they not. They might not even have No, it, right? I think that's, right. that's, that's, that's the, the other, that's the business side of the hospital. And they don't mm-hmm. want, I think, the physician side, the nursing side, the care side to know what's being built because there would be a rebellion, yeah. right? I think. You know that's not fair, uh, right? And and I would say I am now that I I there's no administrator that's like above me. Right. I I'm in private practice. You know I run my own clinic. Yeah. Um, I am more in tune with how much things yeah. cost and feel more comfortable talking about that with patients. Yeah. But a part of that's also just my own personal experience and as a patient. And I know that I would want to know that information. And so those conversations do become easier with people whenever you have that firsthand experience as a patient. Yeah. So Right. Yeah. And there was an ophthalmology patient. I can't remember if she was in the book or in one of the stories where she was on Medicare and she needed cataracts were oh, yeah. taken care of. And she was offered 
several upgrades, and this probably means something to you. Yes. One was a toric lens, and one was some kind of laser scalpel, use of a laser scalpel. And the upgrades were like, and, you know, she said to the doctor, well, which is best? And it's like, well, sure, business class mm-hmm. is better than than coach. Why wouldn't you upgrade? And, uh, right. you know, and it has a yeah. patient to know. And, you know, there, are, I, I think most physicians are, are, incredibly honest and want to do the right thing. There's a small sub segment of people who are really entrepreneurial and, um, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I encourage all the, the physicians, particularly those coming up, you know, listening to just be mindful of prices yeah. and pricing. That's just going to be more in the public awareness over time yeah. it's already moving in that direction like people are are starting to understand a little bit more about the healthcare system especially with all these price transparency laws that are coming out and and so it's just uh it's going to be important i think for people at the point of healthcare to understand all this stuff well and patients too to know that you can oh, yeah. ask what is that going for to sure. cost and is there a cheaper option yeah. exactly and it's, i think the you know, thing also very the good thing you know I'm sure you and I all all worry about is that some people, and we get plenty of letters like this too, emails and uh, like, I'm afraid to go see the doctor. Like my hip has been hurting for, you know, a year and I'm afraid to go to the doctor because I don't know what it will cost or, you know, right. serious medical problems where you want to say you should go right now. but you get it. Yeah. You know, right. people have an $8,000 deductible plan and $500 in their bank account. You know, it's, right. it's a terrible position to put people in. Yeah. I wanted to call the book your well, money Dr. or your life, but they, the, oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's a provocative it was a little title. too it provocative is. and not your, your editors are like, ah, <laughs> yeah. maybe rethink that yeah. one. Well, um, Dr. Rosenthal, I want to thank you so much for coming on uh, to talk with us. Again, your book is An American Sickness, How Healthcare Became Big Business and How You Can Take It Back. What's next for you? Do you have a new book in the wings? Writing or? a book is hard. So I am now, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm now transitioning to writing a bunch of columns like the one you wrote about, you know, healthcare as hospitality and um, I'm I love working, it. I love the short form stuff too. Working on one about yeah. uh, how many of the interventions that, I mean, this is the, God, the, the world of medical billing is so nuts. Um, many of the interventions, preventive interment, sorry, many of the preventive interventions that are supposed to be free under the Affordable Care Act, or at least no cost to patients, billers are figuring out ways to pay. So I have one from a woman who got a mammogram and you know, the mammogram was free, but there was an equipment charge of like $300. Like, okay, is there a non-equipment mam- mammogram you can do for, for you right. know, it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's really nutty. Yeah. And, um, you know, hopefully, I just hope that a little more exposure places like you Absolutely. and what little I can do. You know, all I can no, do is No, keep doing it. Keep keep writing. Yeah, I don't think it's little. These things. <laughs> and then also KFF Health News and NPR, they do the bill of the month that's now in its seventh yeah. year. So that's going strong. You can hear that on your local NPR station every month. And then uh, you are also on X. So uh, you can, people can follow you at Rosenthal Health. Yep. And I know that you share all of your your pieces there as well. And, and check out KFF Health News, which is... I. It's becoming one of my favorite uh, places to to read about. You know, oh, good! It's a great and, bunch of people. Stuff, I'm, so. I'm, you know, it's a great yeah. bunch of people it's who good. think about healthcare and, uh, you know, full of good guys. <laughs> so, and and oh, good okay. chicks <laughs> and Thank good, you. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. are, are actually good, good team of people. Our um, what the health podcast is a, a weekly podcast anchored oh, that's by, an excellent name <laughs> anchored by julie rovner and it's um i wanted to call that chicks talk health because it's all female um oh, nice. so 
I'm really jealous of that name. I know, me too. <laughs> what like, the oh, hell? I wish we would have oh, thought man. of that. That's so well, good. <laughs> it's it's kind of a wonky podcast, but it's really, uh, you know, it's really a, a a good listen. So, thank you guys. Good to know. Yeah. Well, thanks a thank lot. You. Yep, you take okay. Care. Bye. Always love a good opportunity to talk about the U.S. healthcare system. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's think enraging. Are, think people are tired of hearing me talk about it. <laughs> I hope not, because we got a lot more where that <laughs> came from. <laughs> I've got an endless supply of uh, frustration and anger. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, again, I just with, with Dr. Rosenthal there, I I saw, I read her article, and I, I was like, yeah, oh, this person like, like gets it. Right. Like, and so. It's and really then, interesting that it's because she left for 10 years. And right? then could see how drastically it had changed in those 10 years. Because when you're just living it, it's just sort of like you're the frog in hot water that just slowly right. boils, you know. But to exit and then enter so abruptly, it's like... See the difference. Yeah. It really is. That's a fascinating yeah. you know, origin story with right. how, how to get interested in U.S. healthcare and reading and talking about it. So definitely check out her, her, um, uh, her writing and on KFF Health News. And let us know what you thought of the episode. Let you know. Let us know um, if you have any stories. We'd love to hear those. Uh, a great story today. Uh, send us yours at knockknockhigh at human-content.com. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And let us know if you have any ideas for guests you'd like us to talk to. We get a lot of a lot of the guests that come on. People have like mentioned, hey, maybe you should have so-and-so on here. Yeah. You know? Let's, let's, let's do it. So Our audience has very good suggestions. You, you guys got great suggestions. Lots of ways to hit us up. Again, you can email us, knock, knock, high at human-content.com. Hang out with us. Uh, or you could visit us on our social media platforms. You can also hang out with us there. I'm not going <laughs> to tell you when I'm going to be on the social media platforms. <laughs> But you, but you just, might catch it. Just hang out until I'm there. Yeah. I don't know. That's all I can promise you. You can also it's hang like a out. like Pokemon. <laughs> sure. You can also <laughs> hang out with us and our human content podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at human content pods. No Pokemon there, though. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also, uh, also thanks to the great listeners. You threw me off with the Pokemon <laughs> thing. Leaving wonderful feedback. Thank you for the awesome reviews. We love seeing that. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube and give you a shout out, like at Dustoff1472 on YouTube said, are producers your Jonathans? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes of course they, they are. are. They, they, they talk a little bit more than a Jonathan, mm. perhaps a little bit too much at times. A little bit more attitude. Yeah, a little bit more attitude, a little bit more throwing their weight around, especially Shanti. <laughs> uh, she knows what she's talking about, uh, but we love them nonetheless. Uh, and then uh, Dustoff1472 said, enjoying the show. Thanks for sharing. So thank you for that comment. And uh, full video episodes of, are up every week on our YouTube channel at D Glock and Fleck. And we also have a Patreon. Lots of fun perks, bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. Hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. <laughs> you you want to be, a, you don't want to get left behind here. This is, we are taking off. It's uh, to the moon. We are we're going what am I talking about? I don't know. I don't you know. always go a little anyway. off the rails on this part. I'm always a little nervous about what you're going to promise. Early ad-free episode access. I can promise that. Interactive Q&A live stream events and much more. Patreon.com slash Glockenflecken or go to Glockenflecken.com. Speaking of Patreon community perks, new member shout out. Ooh, my favorite time of the day. Sarah T and Stephanie V. Thank you so much for being Welcome. patrons. For joining our little Two growing S's. community. That's right. Shout out as always. A virtual head nod to all the Jonathans. Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Stephen G, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Leah D, K L, Rachel L, Keith G, JJ H, Derek and Mary H, Susanna F, Muhammad K, Aviga, Parker, Ryan, Medical Meg, Bubbly Salt, and Pink Macho. Thank you all. And Patreon Roulette, random shout out to someone on the emergency medicine tier. Doug M. Doug M., thank you for being a patron. And thank you all for listening. We're your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Flockins. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Shanti Brick, Rob Goldman, and Aaron Corney. I, I, I changed it up a little bit. Did you notice that? I, I wasn't listening you to you. Do you just <laughs> zone out on these outros? I, it's so funny because I look over at you and you're like kind of changing your facial expression. You're kind of like, like doing you know, a little head cock and like you're like oh, up smile. A bit. But in, inside, it's just like a hamster on a wheel. You're like nothing's going on. I gotta on. get for groceries you're just today. 
What's in my email? You are, yeah. not, you are not. I'm going to use this to my advantage uh, from the future on here. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omer Benzvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs program, disclaimer, ethics, policies, mission, verification, license, terms, have released her. Go to glockandflagon.com or reach out to us. Knock Knock High at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns. Mm-hmm. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Goodbye. Hey, Kristen. What? You know what people ask me about? How tall you are. Uh, no, sometimes. But no, they ask me about Jonathan. Mm, yes, I have heard people ask Everybody you about that. Everybody wants a Jonathan. They like, do. is Jonathan real? Can I have your Jonathan? I'm like, no, you can't have my Jonathan. But you know what they can have? What's that? Dax co-pilot. Ah, yes, yes, and that is basically a Jonathan. It, it is like having a little Jonathan there. It's yeah. it's a, a an, an AI powered ambient technology. It sits in the room with you, and it, it helps uh, create that clinical documentation, right? While also allowing you to create a patient physician relationship that we all got into medicine to to have. We all want that. That's right. Nobody got in to start writing notes. That's right. And it is right now, everyone feels overwhelmed and burdened by all this clinical documentation uh, to where work-life balance, it just seems unattainable. Right. So to learn more about the Nuance Dragon Ambient Experience or DAX Copilot, visit nuance.com slash discover DAX. That's N-U-A-N-C-E dot com slash discover D-A-X. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.